You know, there's so many things on my heart this morning. I'm like, I really want to just get, you know, like 20 extra minutes to talk about stuff outside of the sermon. Would that be okay, Peyton? Oh, thank you. Peyton, I thought you were going to say you've already taken 20 extra minutes. Um, but, uh, you know, y'all, I'm, I'm reading the news this week and just going, whoa, oh, so much brokenness. And, and I want to say, though, part of why I love coming here on Sunday morning is that we get to come and focus on Christ and Christ alone. And I also love coming here because I get to see this group that together is making an impact around the world. You know, last week I was in Cuba, and I will tell you, if I didn't do this, they'll ask me, and person after person, in five days, we covered half the island of Cuba, probably visited with 40 people, person after person, saying, please tell the brothers and sisters at Northwest, thanks. And you know, it's not just in Cuba, right? It's right after this service, I'm running out, getting in my car, going to cut in front of you on traffic, and I'm going to go and preach at a Burmese church that got started here of refugees, 10-year anniversary. Uh, a, a couple months ago, I was in here doing the 15-year anniversary for our African Missionary Fellowship. In a few weeks, I'm going to go to Silver Spring, Maryland to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of a church Matt Klingler started because of our mission stuff here. Can we just give praise to God for that kind of stuff? Wow. And so um, I just got a lot on my mind, so I'm going to start this morning by asking a question, and I'm going to let y'all do some of the work. I'm not going to do all the work this morning, okay? And I just want to warn you, you know, when I ask a question, I can wait you out, okay? So we could be here for a while. So let's go to this question we're going to start our day with. How does the world pursue Things like confidence, comfort, encouragement, and reassurance. How does the world pursue? And I want you to know a couple things here. I'm not looking for a right or wrong answer. I'm really looking for what you're thinking. And I'm also assuming that some, some if not all, or most of the things we're going to say are not necessarily good or bad. So how does the world pursue confidence, comfort, encouragement, and reassurance? And now I'm waiting for your answers. I can pick on people. Yes, brother. What's that? How did, so how does the world pursue that? When, so that's, that, actually, that's really good, Doug. We feel like we're entitled to it, so what do we do to get it? Okay, money. Let's start with that one. M money. Would you put that up there for us? Money. And what else do we try to get through money? Yes, Meg? Social media, getting likes and number of people who follow us just gives me a sense of, ah, I'm something, right? What else? What's that? Sam, what do you mean by that? Uh, validation of others, yeah. Yes. What, I had one over here. Having friends? Talking to friends. Talking to friends. Yeah. Talking to friends, write that down. Talking to friends and put a slash relationships. Just knowing I have a, a, a few relationships, not a bad thing, just to say I'm okay, right? What else? Freedom. What's that? Freedom. Freedom, yeah. Not a bad thing. But I'll tell you, in Cuba, a lot of limited freedoms there. Jeremy, did you raise your hand? No, Jennifer. Education, yeah, our education. Like, y'all, seriously, I know that I do have this confidence, comfort, reassurance that I went to LSU. You know, it just gives me that. <laughs> so let's make sure and put education slash LSU, please, okay? Oh, I lost all my work. They're going to get it there. Let's put, put that on there. We're not, we're not going to leave in here without seeing LSU on that screen here. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> I did not put Jennifer up to that. I want y'all to know that, okay? Another one. What's that? Yeah, stuff. 
our stuff, our cars, our houses. And y'all, okay, I'm just going to rat you out here. Uh, uh, one of our staff members was talking to somebody who had moved here from California. This is a true story. They moved here from California, and we say they, they were having discussions about things like money and stuff. And they said, you know what? Um, you know, people in California have as much money as people in Dallas. This is a Californian said this. But in, in Dallas, the difference is they like to show how much they have. Judging others. Judging others. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> ben. How about that, though? Seriously. You were going to say it earlier. You just your timing is impeccable. Okay. Uh, well, let's put that. Judging others. Okay. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, because I'm not going to take any more answers after Ben did that to me. I want you to go to Philippians 3, because Paul is writing to a church. The title of this message today is this, Gaining Joy Through Losing. Whew. That's not how we normally think about it, right? We don't think about getting confidence and comfort and reassurance and joy through losing. And Paul's writing to this church. He's writing to a church and he wants to make sure that nothing, nothing, nothing gets in the way of their ultimate joy. In fact, that's why he says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 1, he says, finally, my brothers and sisters, what's the word? Rejoice in the Lord. I've said 23 times in one form or another, whether it's joy, rejoice, glad, thanksgiving, grace, this word shows up because here's what Paul wants for every person in this room. Here's what God wants for every person in this room, a life marked by glad and gracious thanksgiving. You could say it this way, a life marked by gaining joy. It doesn't mean there aren't tears. But he wants for us a life marked by gaining joy. Y'all, this is my favorite chapter of the Bible. I remember as a college student just getting lit up with this thing. At the same time, I was reading about a guy named Jim Elliott. How many are familiar with Jim Elliott? Raise your hand. He was a missionary, 1950-something, missionary to South America, a group of people who had didn't know the gospel, never heard the name of Jesus. He goes down there. But he goes because of an attitude about his whole life that is maybe captured like no other place except in his journals in 1951. And I want to read this to you because as a college student, it just caught me. Jim Elliott wrote this. I walked out to the hill just now. It is exulting delicious to stand embraced by the shadows of a friendly tree with the wind tugging at your coattail and heaven hailing your heart to gaze and glory and to give oneself again to God. What more could a person ask? You see what Elliott's saying there? That somehow my joy in Jesus is so real that when I go out into his creation and I feel the wind, it is calling me to give myself to him. That's rejoice in the Lord, okay? And, and then he says this, oh, the fullness, pleasure, sheer excitement of knowing God on earth. Rejoice in the Lord. There it is right there. Now he says, I care not if I never raise my voice again for him, if only I may love him, please him. Let's just go back to that one second, please. I care not if I never raise my voice again for him. You know what that is? That's the preacher who gets a little confidence, comfort, reassurance from getting to be on the stage and use his voice. And he says, if right now, if, if at this second I couldn't speak another word, if only I could love him. That's rejoicing in the Lord. Then he says this. Next slide, it goes like this. Perhaps in mercy, God shall give me a host of children that I may lead through the vast star fields to explore his delicacy whose fingers end set them to burning. Here's what he's saying. Maybe God will give me a bunch of kids and I can take them through creation and show them that it was the work of his hands. But if not, if I don't have any kids... If only I may see him, smell his garments, and smile into my lover's eyes, ah, then not stars nor children shall matter, only himself. 
Rejoice in the Lord. You know, the way Paul captures this idea in this text, when he says, whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ, I want to give you this, this today. Nothing beats knowing Christ. Amen. Nothing beats knowing Christ. And we're saying mindset matters. That's the, this sermon series. So I want you just to take, this is your takeaway today, right up front. A, a mindset, something to burn some grooves in your brain as we've talked about. So let's say it together. Nothing beats knowing Christ. And again, nothing beats knowing Christ. And again, nothing beats knowing Christ. Now, I want you to know, Paul's writing to a group of people because there was all kinds of messages that said, oh, there's a few things we got to add to Christ. And there's a few things you ought to hold on to. Because in the world system, gaining joy through losing doesn't make sense. So he says, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble for me. It's a safeguard for you. I don't want you to trip up over those things that the world says we gain confidence, comfort, and reassurance from. And now he's going to talk about what was going on in their specific circumstance. Verse 2, he says, beware the dogs, beware the evil workers, beware the false circumcision. I want to ask you a question. How many here have a dog? Raise your hand if you got a dog. Ben, what's the, since you're helping me out today, Ben, what's the name of your dog? Georgian Tucker. I want to tell you, he ain't talking about Georgian Tucker here, okay? When he talks about dogs there, he's talking about scavengers that pick the bone clean. He's talking about a group of people. He calls them evil workers because they are stirring up problems in people's hearts. Here's the people. We know this from multiple texts of scriptures. There were some Jewish people who came to know Jesus. We believe in Jesus. But here's what they said. Jesus Christ plus our good works gives us salvation and comfort, confidence, and reassurance. Jesus Christ plus making sure we catch every feast day gives us our confidence, comfort, and reassurance. Jesus Christ plus and I, and I want you to hear today when we talk about coming into a relationship with the eternal God who created the world, we are saying Jesus Christ plus nothing. Paul says, beware the dogs, beware the evil workers, beware the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision. Circumcision. We won't talk too long about it. It could get awkward. Circumcision. Uh, <laughs> It was this identifying trait for the people of God. It was the mark. It, it was also the mark that said this. There's nothing too personal. There's nothing in your life or my life that God doesn't have a say-so over. Is that the kind of God you have? He says, we have the mark of really being God's people. For we're the true cir circumcision. And he says, let me tell you, we worship in the spirit of Christ. Now, when he says we worship in the spirit of God here, you remember when Jesus said, God is looking for worshipers who worship him in what? Spirit and truth. When he says we worship in the spirit of God, he is saying that there is a, a real change that took place when you came to know Christ. That he set in motion a change in your affections. So that when Jim Elliott says, church, I walked out to the hill just now, it is exalting, delicious to stand embraced by the shadows of a friendly tree and have heaven hailing your coattail. I want you to know that that wasn't just for a unique group of people. That was for every person here who has the spirit of Jesus in them. And I want you to know, it's why, it's why I actually heard some amens in this church where we're kind of conservative with our amens. Um, when I said, nothing beats 
knowing Christ. Because your heart wants to take a leap. That's what he's talking about here. And he says, we worship in the spirit of Christ and we glory in Christ Jesus. Now, we glory in Christ Jesus. Here's the idea. We brag about Jesus. Everybody here, you're going to brag about something. Amen? If you don't think of it that way, everybody here says something you talk about. That's what he's saying here. I was at a physical therapy appointment not long ago with a, a, a PT, and his name's Devin. And I went there because a lot of the guys there are um, cyclists. And uh, some guy he works with is a cyclist that I know. And I asked Devin, I said, Devin, do you cycle? And immediately Devin said this to me. He goes, yes, but I don't brag about how far I go. <laughs> Everybody has something they talk about. Here, yo, here's one of the ways you know what your confidence, comfort, and reassurance is based in. It's the thing you talk about the most. Or a lot. Not saying it's bad. I'm just saying... If we're talking about gaining joy through losing, we better understand what the thing is we're holding in our hands because really what we want are empty hands and an open heart to receive as much as Jesus as possible. And so Paul says this interesting thing. He says, we put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone has a mindset to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. We're talking about mindset, right? And it's, as if Paul says, okay, you guys, you want to brag about the things you got confidence, comfort, and reassurance in? You guys who think you're very religious, you're saying Jesus Christ plus good works, keeping feast days. Well, let's do some bragging here. Let's have a little bragging contest. And Paul says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel. Only a true Jewish person, a little baby boy, gets to be circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. The tribe of Benjamin. Now, when Paul says, I'm of the nation of Israel, he says, I'm the best nation in the world, but I'm also part of the unique club of being of the tribe of Benjamin. Y'all remember when the nation of Israel split? Ten tribes went, went one way. Two tribes went the other way. Judah was with David, and Benjamin went with them. First king is a Benjamite. And so he says, listen, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Not only that, as to law, I was a Pharisee, which means I didn't compromise. I didn't compromise with the government. I didn't give an inch what I believed. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. I did it all. I had some checklists. How, how many of y'all like to create a to-do list every day, checklist. That was, that was Paul. When Paul was a little boy, he heard, here's what little, good little boys do. Here's one of the ways you know. Y'all, here's one of the ways you know what might be your confidence, comfort, and reassurance. It was the things you grew up hearing. Good little boys and girls do this, right? It, it was Paul. Okay, how many achievers do I have here? Raise your hand if, if, if you know, on one of the personality tests you're an achiever. Y'all know what Edding and Graham is, right? Number three is the achiever. Dallas, we got a whole city of achievers. I'm, I'm looking at a couple of friends I went to Cuba with this past week, and I remember we're sitting down having a, our little debrief that we normally do at a restaurant in Miami, and we're there, and we're talking about how did it go? And I was like, well, it went great. But I, I was kind of feeling kind of frustrated. One, for all the Americans, the translators, and all the Cubans, that was the comic relief whenever I used my Spanish. <laughs> and because the fact is we traveled through for five days, visited about 40 people, half the island of Cuba, it didn't feel like I was doing much. And I was really struggling with what have I actually done here? Next morning, I opened my Bible and I'm meditating on this. And God hit me and says, Neil, there's your achiever. It's not necessarily a bad thing. You want to get some things done. But when your confidence, comfort, and reassurance comes from being an achiever, you know what happens when you don't achieve? 
You don't have joy, you're depressed, right? Paul goes on to say, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have done what? What's the word? Count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever things were gained to me, those things guys, I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul, before he was even a believer, had a list of things that made him feel really good. We just read them. When he comes to Christ, basically he puts a big mark through those and says, Christ and Christ alone. Faith in Christ plus nothing is my salvation. So I want to say something here to some folks who are either online or in person, and you really haven't got to the place in your life where you've yet to say, I am believing in Jesus and Jesus alone for my salvation. I want you to know, Jim, who got up and gave that testimony, I didn't know he was going to say this. He said something very interesting. He said, blind leap of faith. The guy said, you, uh, you're taking a blind leap of faith. I want you to know, when we talk about faith in Christ, there's nothing about it that's a blind leap of faith. It is not blind. This word, count it, is actually saying, if you're thinking about coming to know Jesus, here's what you need to do. You need to make an assessment. You need to count. You need to think about all the things you're putting your trust in to make you feel good about yourself, to make you feel good before God and others. You make an assessment. You evaluate. You judge. And then you choose. Okay? I'm asking you to do that. And I want you to hear, sometimes people say it's easy. I don't think it's easy. When I first came to this place where I knew Christ, where I said, I'm going to believe in Christ's life, death, and resurrection, that about a year later, I decided for the summer I was going to go to Panama City Beach, Florida to be with about 50, 60 other college students from all across the country and just learn as much as I could about nothing beats knowing Christ and having conversations about Jesus. So I worked at a grocery store, and then uh, during the week, I would just talk to people on the beach about Jesus. In fact, I was leading the whole group in that little area. I come home, and I go to a family wedding. Now, you got to understand, there's my brother. My, my dad and his brother owned Tomba Communications and Electronics, the family business. That at least in my mind, I had picked myself to take it over. Um, I'm talking to my cousin, who's the oldest of the five boys, and he says, what did you do this summer? Because he had heard something about it. I said I was in Panama City at the beach. Where did you work? I said I worked at a grocery store. What? What were you doing? Stocking shelves. And he thought, I had just lost everything. I'm not saying stocking shelves is a bad job, but to my cousin, Tomba didn't do that. He said, why were you there? Talk to people about Jesus. What? And you can see he's mad. Finally, I walk away. He goes his way, and I come to his brother, who apparently had been overhearing the conversation, wasn't a believer at the time. Here's what his brother says to me. He could see I was struggling. He said, Neil, you need to know it's really hard for a Tampa to become a Christian because of our pride. And I just want to tell you, if you're thinking about it today, really believing in Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, I want you to know it's not just hard for Tombas, it's hard for everybody in this room to say, you know, the things I'm putting my confidence, comfort, and reassurance in, whether it's my life, my business, my abilities, whatever was on that list, my money, my relationships, it's hard to say, you know what, none of that, none of that is what God is looking for. It is Christ plus nothing. And I want you to know, there is joy to be gained there. And I want you to hear, I'm inviting you into the ultimate joy. Paul goes from there, 
Next verse, if you look at it with me, because I want to say something to all of us here. And he says in verse 8, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost. Now, I want to say a word here. Let's be really clear. When we say Christ plus nothing, I'm saying this. God cannot love you. If you've believed in Jesus, he cannot love you any more than he loves you right in this moment. You hear me say that? I don't care what you did last night. I don't care if you've blown up your life recently. Christ plus nothing says God cannot love you any more than he loves you right now. And what Paul is talking about here is getting as much joy as absolutely possible when he says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in order that I may gain Christ that I, may, uh, that I may know him as much as possible, that it requires some loss. That if I'm holding on to everything the world has to offer, everything I think I am, you know what? My hands are full. And what we're talking about is emptying the hands of our heart to gain as much as Christ as possible. And here's what he says in verse 9, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. We got to talk about righteousness here. Word shows up three times. When we talk about God being righteous, we are saying this, that he is perfectly good in every thought, action, attitude, judgment, power he exercises in this world, perfectly good. And what we're saying about Jesus is that he is the sum of, Of all goodness. That's where joy is. Every person here is looking for a righteousness. Every person. Y'all, you see, when it says, can I go back to my answers here? When I ask you that question, where are you trying to get comfort, convenience, or comfort, um, encouragement, reassurance, thank you. And we say these things like money, relationships, I submit to you that is your righteousness according to the Bible. That's the thing you're looking for to say, I'm good and I have goodness. And sometimes it's really good things. Sometimes it's things that aren't as good. And Paul says this, everybody here is looking for a righteousness. And I had to say, I'm not looking for a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Now, how do you know? What's a way to know, am I making these things my righteousness? This is really important. Let me ask you, for those of you who know your Bible, how did Paul respond when his righteousness was being threatened? How did Paul respond when the system that he said he was going to get righteousness from, of the Jewish law, how did he respond when it was threatened? If you don't know how it was threatened, it was when a movement came along called The Way, followers of Jesus, who said, Christ plus nothing gains you righteousness. How did Paul respond? Somebody tell me. Doug, Ben said, persecuting. Doug said, out of anger. When his righteousness was threatened, he was furious. He was angry. One of the ways we know. One of the ways we know what our righteousness is. One of the ways we know if it's money, social media, friends, relationships, freedom, education, stuff. When that is threatened and we get angry, that's one of the ways we know. It might be our righteousness and we really don't believe Jesus Christ plus nothing. It's one of the ways we know we are not moving toward joy. Now, somebody's going to say to me, if I don't say this, somebody's going to say, well, getting angry sometimes isn't bad. I- I'm not talking about that, okay? I-, I-, I understand. But here's what happens. Somebody shows you disrespect. What do you do? How dare you not respect me? There's your righteousness right there. Somebody steals some money from you. Anybody ever have somebody steal money from them? investment deal or something. I know a lot of you have because I've talked to you. See, is it okay to be angry over that? I think so, but if it takes you 
the rest of your life to get over that anger, that money might have been your righteousness, your sum of goodness right there. Paul says, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness of him comes on, from God on the basis of faith that I may know him. How does Paul say this? How does Paul get to a point where he had that big resume? There's another way you might know what your righteousness is. You look at your resume and how good you feel when you're writing it out. How does Paul get to that point where I'm going to tell you Paul had something. Paul got a vision of Jesus himself. Right? We also know that there was this time period where he got caught up in heavenly places where God was revealing things to him, I think, to help him write the Bible we have. But you know what's so interesting even about that? That even in the special revelation Paul got, you know what Paul, God did? <sighs> Paul tells us, and God gave me a thorn in the flesh so that I would not take pride in that. See, some of y'all, you know what? You've prayed a lot. You've read your Bible a lot. You've memorized your Bible a lot. All good things that I'm telling us to do them, right? And God says, but you don't actually take pride in those things. Christ and Christ alone. Paul goes on to say that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. You want something to pray for in light of this? The power of his resurrection, we'll just say it this way, the ability to not let anything stand in the way between you and ultimate joy. The power of his resurrection. He says the fellowship of his sufferings. Here Paul goes again talking about suffering and we're talking about joy. I said a couple weeks ago that in light of some preaching out there that seems to say you should never suffer, I wanted you to get a highlighter out and go through your New Testament all the times Christ suffered and you're called to suffer. Paul said, Philippians 1, 27, it has been granted to you not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. How does that work? Here's a thought about the mystery of suffering and intimacy with Jesus. First service, I was talking to my friend who she has lost a child. If you've ever known the loss of a child dying, you know what you want to do? You want to talk to someone else who has suffered the loss of a child dying because they get you and you get them. If you have suffered the loss of living in a family where one member has an addiction, okay? And I gotta say that right because one of the ways the world has told us to go, out of, go after comfort and reassurance is through drugs, alcohol, and other things that often people get addicted to. And y'all, I have to say it here because I read the Wall Street Journal that says America is drunk and that was 10 years ago. And I don't say this to guilt anybody, but to say, yo, we're talking about trying to choose joy. And if you've experienced the suffering and loss of living with someone with an addiction over time, you know what? You want to talk to somebody who's experienced the suffering and loss of somebody who's who's also been in a family with addictions because they get you. And Paul says this, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings because in that, the the way God has orchestrated this thing is, I get Jesus and he gets me. I want to know that kind of intimacy. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. And watch what it says here, being conformed to his death. You want to move toward joy, you get away from this line. Here's the line right here. This line right here represents being as close to all that the world has to offer as I can. It means being as close to sin as I can. And Paul says, I want to be conformed to his death. Now, in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, Paul gives you the mindset about living a new life in Christ. He says, you consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And what Paul says is, I want to be conformed to his death because I want to be as far away as possible from my former manner of life where I was trusting in all kinds of other things for my comfort, my reassurance, my encouragement. And here's what most of us are doing. We're walking as close as we can to this. 
and we're never even giving a thought to what am I trusting in? What is my righteousness? C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, we are like children making mud pies in the slum when an offer of a vacation at the beach is there available for us. My granddaughter Zuri came home one day from school wearing a broken bracelet. Vila is on top of these kinds of things. And so Vila says, hey, Zuri, where, where, where'd you get that bracelet? Zuri says, from Sally. Now Vila's digging in. Uh, why'd Sally give you the bracelet? Oh, she didn't give it to me. I, I bought it from her for $2. Ouch. Here's what I think happened, and I'm pretty sure I'm accurate. Zuri gave away something that was of real value to her, $2, for a little momentary pat on the back, a smile, a hug from Sally. That little temporary moment and a broken bracelet. And Paul writes to a group of people. And he says, I want to tell you the way to gain joy is through losing. It's called Jesus Christ plus nothing. And what I want you to do is move as far away as possible as you can. From your former manner of life and for all the things that you're holding on to that makes you feel good about yourself. In verse 11, he says, because this is where I'm going. In verse 11, he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. It sounds like Paul may be doubting he's going to make it. I don't think that's what's happening there. Over and over again, Paul talks about the assurance of someone who's trusting in Christ that they are going to be resurrected with Christ. I think what Paul is saying, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to die here in prison or if Jesus is going to come back before, but I know this. My eyes are locked on Jesus because nothing beats knowing Christ. And, and I'm just looking for the day. I got a vision of him once, but I'm looking for the day that John wrote about when he said, beloved, it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. Y'all, I want you to think about that for a moment. Church, it has not appeared as yet what you and I shall be. I'll tell you this, we will not be the sum of our money and our relationships and our power and our control and however our, um, you know, whatever things, our education or our family or where we grew up or the house we own, we, we will not be the sum of that. It has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when Jesus appears, we shall be like him. <sighs> we're going to be like the sum of all goodness. All that stuff we ever wanted, we're going to have because we are going to see him just as he is. We're going to get what Paul got that day. We're going to get a vision of Jesus and we're going to get more. <sighs> Jim Elliot had his own version of nothing beats knowing Christ. It's the thing that took him to a foreign land and to basically say, I will leave behind everything. He said it this way. He is no fool to give up what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. Lord, I pray, there's a lot here, and I know there's a lot of different ways right now that people can go with this in their heart. I pray that we would be open to considering what are the things that I'm holding on to with the hands of my heart 
that give me a little temporary confidence and comfort and reassurance that are ultimately keeping me from as much joy as possible. Holy Spirit, would you work it into our mind that nothing beats knowing